Good evening and welcome back to the shop here in beautiful Canterbury, New Hampshire. I'm excited to talk to you tonight about outdoor finishes um, very briefly because as you know, I'm not an outdoor furniture guy. <laughs> I've had some nice exchanges with uh, people who've been working on outdoor furniture. This is the time of year. Here we are right in early, well, we're almost May. And the feeling of spring is coming to life here, even though it was 35 degrees uh, last night. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's kind of, uh, I know not everywhere do you have a springtime, but here we definitely have the cycles of the four seasons. And uh, we have, it feels like a long winter and then spring, and then we have beautiful summers around here. So. We pay for them in the winter. But uh, the feeling of spring makes you want to get outside and do some outdoor projects. And it is, it's one of the harder times of the year I find that I get itchy to get outside. Uh, most of the time I love being out here, but I kind of want to get out there. So I decided I, I've got a little project going on that involves outdoor furniture, and it got me thinking a lot about outdoor finishes as well. So, we're gonna get into that in just a second, but I just wanna welcome you and mm -hmm. say if you wanna go deeper with us, head on over to epicwoodworking.com. Thank you all of you who are coming to the Epic Weekend in um, September and October, right? Yes. Yes, right. we still have some spots. We're excited. Lots of people returning and lots of newbies. So it's yeah. so exciting. Two in September and two in October. We've got an awesome uh, slate of plans for that. We learned a lot last year. Uh, thanks for some to some great advisors. And uh, mm -hmm. we uh, just had such a wonderful time. I think if you're coming, we can't wait to see you and have you here in the shop with us yeah, to enjoy. Yeah, if you're curious. I'm sorry. I Say that again. Off. I was just going to give them the link if they were curious about yeah. it. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, epicgoodworking.com slash epic dash weekend. You can go there. So. That's right. And, and when you come, you're going to actually get to be in the audience for one of these shop night lives. You even meet the camera lady and see the amazing... <laughs> <laughs> There's a draw. I know. It's we huge. put it in there, but it's not really. A lot of people want to see the camera lady. They want me to turn the camera around. We did that once, and, and we did it mm. once. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't comfortable with it. That's a little bit. Well, I'm just not as, as you got a lot stellar. Of, you got you a lot of gear of on you. Camera? Too. Yeah. So. so, anyway, we also have some great guests. We've got Garrett Hack and Alan Breed. If you're in the woodworking world, those names are familiar to you. You may know a lot about mm -hmm. them. So we're excited to uh, share those guys in this space with you. Um, so enough with that. Um, I want to get into the content for the night. And this is kind of what's going on right now. And I, as my... A uh, little letter sent it out to you. I talked about what's on your bench. And the most common question that woodworkers get asked, and you've probably been asked this a hundred times too, but people always say, so what you working on? I mean, not when we're here in the shop, but when I'm out and about, you know, what am I working on? Well, I'm always working on a lot of things, it seems like. <laughs> things are never finished. But... Um, this week, I am working on this outdoor bench project because I'm going to do a special video using a multi-router. I've teased you with a, a, router, a cutting router uh, tool, but uh, the multi-router made by woodpeckers, um, I've got one. Honestly, I have looked at these for 30 years. Mm. And... Uh, Back when they came out, it was, I forget the name of the previous company, but Woodpeckers bought the company and revamped and improved it in such a way that I can't wait to start making some cuts. So I'm going to be building these uh, outdoor benches uh, using the multi-router, and I'm going to just see how fast and smooth something like that can go. 
course, she can do it the other way, too. And we've made a video of the swing, which we'll talk about in a second. And it's essentially, it's the same as the swing project, just with different legs. But before we show you the, the outdoor um, bench, I want to just catch you up on the little testing I've been doing on my slab. And this has some relationship to outdoor finishes because we think a lot about the protective nature of epoxy on outdoor furniture. Um, one great suggestion that a lot of people like to do, and it's an excellent idea, is to soak or saturate the bottom of the feet that are going to rest on the ground in epoxy. So, I mean, you can flip them upside down or you could put it in a little tray and let it uh, draw right up into the leg. But to seal the bottoms of the feet is huge because you won't get that water wicking up and rotting the legs prematurely. Epoxy is amazing. It's really great outside. And, and because you're not exposing it to sunlight too, it just holds up a lot better as well. But you know, remember the slab table? We did this, we talked about this um, a few weeks ago. And I mixed up some of this uh, System 3 general purpose epoxy. And I thinned it a touch with denatured alcohol. You can thin it with denatured alcohol, lacquer thinner, or acetone. Uh, those are the main three. And you don't need much, but it's so viscous. You know how it is. Um, and when I put it on, check it out. Look at, can you come in and look at this color? Sure. So I, look at that. The, this little golden area here, that's where it's, it's starting to look finished. So I put one coat on here, and you can see how dry it is. This side, I did a second coat, and I still have these dry patches because it's still wicking in. This was the driest area. This, so this is like that big um, ash tree I had behind the shop, and this is one of the cookies that um, it got a little rotted around the edge, and I was disappointed, but I am really psyched that the color looks naturally like that in a lot of areas, and then it has a mottled look to it. The not so exciting part are the black uh, splotches here, but uh, there's not much you can do about that. Um, so, but it, it's going to add a lot of variation. Some of it is actually spalted, so it should be pretty nice. But it was interesting to see how much it drew in and how it went from being soft, like see this area over here? This is unprotected. If I push my thumbnail in there, you can see I can push right in. And then over here, where I've got, I can't barely make a mark. And this, this just has that epoxy saturated in. So it really hardens up the surface. With two coats, I've, I figured the second coat would lay on top, you know, because the first one went down in quite a lot. I, I, I put a fair amount on there, but the second one weeped in just on the outer area, and it's, it's, not, it's more standing on the inner solid area. So I think one more coat, and I will have it. And then the nice thing about epoxy is you don't have to use it as your final material. You can actually go over it uh, sand it down and then put on some type type of nicer varnish or something like that. You know, I think water locks would work nice on this, but I'm I'm really thinking of these as being little um, coffee tables and more or less. If I can get them to my kids, if they didn't live too far away, <laughs> like they do right now, now that they get them. <laughs> I know that's the problem. It's shipping everything, but. Um, a question coming from Kevin, could you possibly bleach the dark areas? Good question, Kevin. I, I was thinking of that, that as I was saying it. I don't think so. This is just, uh, I don't know. If you go in there with bleach, you, you're going to affect all this nice golden area too, I bet. But I, I don't think it's that kind of stain. It is really just through and through. But I think I'm going to do another test because I still am going to take this layer down a little more. So whatever I do here, I'm going to be skimming away. So anyway, this is kind of the process. 
you go through sometimes when you're experimenting with new finishes. And this is new for me, like to think of using epoxy as a finish element. I have used it once, twice, you know, to fill um, cracks more for structural integrity, but not so much as a base for a finish in a case like this. So kind of fun to deal with this. I know some of you probably have a lot of experience with epoxy and um, also, you know, maybe you made a river, river table or something like that. It's expensive stuff though. You know, it's, we put a link for this system three and um, you know, a smaller kit, I don't know, it's like 40 bucks. This, this bottle retail, uh, let's see what do I got here. I've got a quart and uh, a pint. So this together, you know, makes you three pints of, of uh, epoxy and this one's 32 bucks and this one's 25. So not cheap, you know, 47 bucks for not even a gallon. Have you tried uh, Smith's gallon. original clear penetrating epoxy? No. Sealer? Andrew no. says it's great for outdoor finishing. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, we uh, chat in if you've got recommendations. I like to hear them. And, you know, we've been going back and forth a little bit on the, uh, in the neighborhood, if you, I didn't mention that, but on our website, if you want to really get access to us. <laughs> move in. Move into the neighborhood. <laughs> and, uh, man, we have some good chatter going on in the forum, the Over the Fence forum. And uh, so... It's been, we've talked some about epoxies, but where was I going with that? Um, but outdoor. Sharing, probably sharing ideas of supplies and things maybe. Yeah, yeah, right. So sharing different ideas of suppliers. It's amazing. Um, this is a new kind of area. I mean, I've touched into it, but I love to hear what you guys think and go for that. All right, so that's my plan. I'm going to. Check that out. I will experiment with the with the bleach, really to to get out black. Sometimes it's so bad, like you'd have to go really intense bleach, like a two part bleach, and then that kind of wrecks the coloration of the other. It almost greens it out a little. So I'm not sure. I think I might end up living with the black because it's just too integrated into it, unfortunately. But. Okay. All Steve's right. asking, how would bar spar work? Three to four layers? Is, is that something you... Bar spar? <laughs> I'm not sure. It's that might work sense. fine. I mean, um, yeah, there's all kinds. There's bar top epoxy resins, and that's the one you usually think of when it's like really dead flat and heavy. What? Is that killing you to say bar spar? <laughs> bar spar. I said it my <laughs> R's, right? Bar spar. <laughs> No, if you if you want to finish your bar, <laughs> you know, uh, so anyway, I have not used bar bar spar, bar spar. So, but I'll okay. check it out. I love to. Where All right, going? I'm going over here. I want to move over here next. I, before we talk about the bench, I wanted to show you what some I worked on. Uh, catch you up on something else in the pro in the hey. shop. Remember that cherry, that chunk of cherry I showed you? And we cut one up. Uh, we just chopped one a little bit. Um, well, this is a hunk of that cherry. This one I didn't cut up yet, but just this is, I ended up splitting all these logs. And, oh, I remember I was showing you the uh, anchor seal. So all of these little chunks are going to be, they're bowl blanks now. And I put anchor seal on the end, so I'm not gonna get any checks. And when I cut across, I eliminated the pith or came right up to it. Like you can see, I came right up to it there. So, um, Claude just chimed in. He did? <laughs> yeah, I've got a few of these. I've got like, yes. yeah. Blanks. So I've got some that aren't so good that I'm gonna practice with and uh, <laughs> But a lot of nice looking uh, cherry there for some bowls. And I'm going to give one of those to my sister for the, give me that wood. All right, check this out. Okay, 
So this is a little home project here. Uh, this is actually the bench. If you did come last year or you visited ever and you saw that swing hanging behind the shop between those large um, oaks, this is the bench. And this is made of white oak, which weathers really well, but the finish I put on it did not. <laughs> Can you tell? So what I have on here is not a great spar urethane. It's uh, Helmsman by Minwax. Now, admittedly, I didn't probably put enough coats on initially because I wanted to get it coated and get it out there. I think I put two fast coats on there. Then I put another coat on before the next year. And then I left it out there all winter. Hmm. Bad. But that's not so much the problem. What kills these finishes more than anything is our UV rays. So it's the sunlight. It just, there, there's no finishes that are impervious to that over time. There's some really good ones like Epiphanes. Am I saying that right? That came out highly rated. Um, there's this one here. This one is for Marine. I did something here, high performance polyurethane yacht finish, yacht varnish. I used this on my yacht. <laughs> Your model yacht. Excuse me. <laughs> well, anyway, I can't. <laughs> I did make a table for a small yacht like boat. Um, and I finished it with this, this material. It was awesome. And um, it, uh, it does, this does have UV protection in it. So that's huge. If you're going to get a really good finish for outside, you got to have UV protection. But I'm telling you, e even with that, it's like you got to recoat it every two or three years at the most, you know. And with this other... Uh, spar I had to hit it every year and then I let it go and it got away from me and you know the finish starts to break down and then with oak especially some moisture gets in there and you get that black staining and it's I'm not actually sure what it is this is where my I'm not an expert with outdoor finishes you don't deal with this with indoor finishes but I think it's some kind of mildew um, I I washed, I sanded this down, I washed it down with bleach, uh, regular household like bleach, cut a little bit, and I sanded it again, and I'm done with varnish. I'm gonna paint it, okay? So paint is another excellent outdoor finish. Uh, it'll last longer, but you know, when you're, when you're tired of varnishing, you gotta go with the paint. So that's what I'm doing. So next time you come, this is going to be painted. And I, I don't know if I'm liking this color as much. I made a sample board. Are you ready? Remember the paint we picked out the other day? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm so here's the it. primer. Huh. What? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, this light is not quite right. Oh, yeah. because I'm, Always blame it on the light. <laughs> but... I was thinking I like a red bench because it's, it's out in the green trees and the way those are like opposite on the color wheel, they kind of resonate with each other. You know, you have a red, but that red, I'm not so happy about. I can take it by the uh, shop and they can squirt a little something in there to push it one way or the other if you want to do that. This primer actually was white primer that um, it's Benjamin Moore Fresh Start Primer, white. And I just took some, some of this uh, trans tint that I don't use a lot. It's burnt umber, but it's not a good color. I, it just never works for me, so I, I don't use it. So I put like, um, you know, a bunch of drops into this little jar of primer, and it gave me like a nice darker gray so that I, that's what I'm going to do, so that I don't have to top coat it, you know, as much. But... This is going to be really protective. That's what I do like. I think I'll put this board out there in the setting and see if we still like that. What do you think? You okay with it? I am okay with that. I think it'll look all right. Um, You're getting some good input here on some things that people um, have used, so we could read this later. Okay. I'm curious, too, what someone would uh, 
in that setting, if you don't know it, it's just in this beautiful little green, or there's like ferns and there's the big trees and, um, and the benches out there. And it was, it did look great, golden, golden oak, but have to say goodbye to that. Could have painted it yellow or something to try to maintain, but then green felt like it would melt in too much. So went for a little splash of color and I thought the red would be nice, but we'll see. All right, so my project, other than painting this, is making the bench version of this. And so if I look at this from the side, you know, I forgot to tell you about that video. We did a video where I redesigned this um, to uh, make it into a bench as well. And so we actually have plans, full-size plans and a course. Yeah, that's what I was leading up to. <laughs> no, actually I wasn't. Uh, for this, uh, to make this, if you like this style, it's super comfortable. Yes, it is. So and many good hours sitting on that. Yeah, and the swing, it's awesome. It's like pitch. And so when I designed the bench, I tried to give it a nice pitch as well. So when you sat in it, it just scoop you up and you would just feel so comfortable in there and that's what we did we gave it a little bit of a lean back but I had to extend the leg and sweep it back and the front leg so this that actually that design for the back leg and the front leg is now included when you get the hanging bench plan so you can make either the the like outdoor bench or the hanging bench so have fun with that so these are the first uh, outdoor benches that I've made that go right to the floor so I'm excited to make those using that uh, that cool multi router machine so anyway um, when I when I made this I had to go out and get the materials so I went over to our friends at Goose Bay, as you know. And well, check it out over here. Here on this on this pile, I've got our, all the materials are now dimensioned. I've got the arm stock here, the sides. These are uh, some mid rails. Here's my templates from the previous. Here's my arm profile. And oh yeah, this is the this is the hanging swing template so that's using the hollow chisel mortiser I'll be doing it a little different way because I'll be doing using that slot with a router bit we'll leave rounded ends and then these are the front legs so now these need to be quite a bit longer you know so that's what we've got here um, right in here now I had a nice little back and forth with Tony hey Tony <laughs> about uh, some some rotting cypress in a seat slat and it was upsetting to find out that's happening even with paint on it and uh, what on his Adirondack chair Adirondack chair yeah what he was told was that um, it was very it was young cypress so it didn't have the oil protection I have a feeling it might have been faster growing too because I pick up this piece and it's lighter and I look at the end grain and you can see how how far apart the growth rings are here you know they're they're almost a quarter inch three sixteenths of an inch it's weird because they came from the same plank and then I pick this one up and it's it's weighty hold them still hun. yeah and look at this one this one, let's turn them so they're oriented the same way here. Well, it's sort of oriented, but look how tight those are. And this is, this just feels nicer. So this one gives me a lot more confidence that it's going to hold up. And I'm thinking for the front leg, I want to make sure I have really nice quality and I don't run into that rotting. But I will still, I'll use this one, but I'm going to make sure I saturate the bottom with epoxy before, um, more than likely, I'm going to just paint these benches and not, not mess with the outdoor finishes. Um, but maybe one of you will convince me <laughs> that it's cypress. It does look nice with a natural finish. What would you use if you weren't painting? Um, 
and we'll see where we go from there. Yeah, there's lots of good stuff. Had, did you ever consider just leaving it unpainted? Yes, yes. That's the other option. Like, um, I remember working with a, a client, and he had bought some furniture from England that was outdoor furniture, beautiful, like, uh, nice curves to it, and it was all white oak. And one of their recommendations to buying this, it was pricey, too, was just let it gray, which it, you can do. I mean, virtually all wood will go gray outside under UV light, but it's going to get kind of rough, and, um, you know, the white oak will hold up. If you use a good waterproof glue, you shouldn't have a problem. So, um, you know, when I do these benches, I use mortise and tenons, and I peg them and use waterproof glue. So we've got a lot of that going on. But, yeah, you can just use no finish at all and let it go gray. But, um, I don't know. If you want to use a little hair color... <laughs> Don't go gray. All right, so what was the other question you had? Um, I do have a question, if it's okay for me to ask. Yeah, Dennis sure. is curious, um, what would be the traditional wood use for outdoor benches? Like in England, they have a lot of them, and they seem to weather pretty well. Yes. Well, white oak, as I just mentioned, that's, uh, I'm sure they use that a lot over there because that company was in England, and... Uh, that's, they raved about that being the best source. So white oak is a great wood against the elements. Um, but then, you know, mahogany used to be used a lot outdoors for outdoor furniture and decks of ships and whatnot. Uh, cypress, of course, then locust. Um, there's several others. Just pitch in if you've got any good ideas. Teak. Stewart's oh, yeah, there. teak is amazing, but it's also... Lo black locust. Crazy pricey, yeah. Great. Oh, you just said that, sorry. No, that's all right. I didn't say black locust, I just no. said locust. So. I'm not sure of the difference. I've never used it myself. All right, so um, anyway, so you can go with paint, finish, or whatnot. So check out this. I've got my parts here. My long rails are over here. So I've already machine and get these ready. I'm going to cut them to length and then I'm just going to blast out the mortise and tenon joinery and, and get good video of all that. I did a little video of picking this material up and um, prepping it because we're going to edit this video down of making the outdoor benches. So unlike <laughs> like these, we're going to actually go the full way and make it a shorter <laughs> edited video. Now this is, these are the back slat for the back slats. So this is for these pieces here. These will be the same um, for the bench seat. They're going to have that curvature. But I ran into some issues because I'm putting a mortise and tenon on here, a true mortise and tenon. I had to make my pattern a little longer to accommodate the tenon. My initial pattern on these was just cut short because I used a floating tenon, floating tenons on the top and bottom. So, you know, this is a great project to use a uh, domino for these because these slats are really captured between a top horizontal rail and a lower horizontal seat rail. And just using a, the um, plugs for the um, domino, that works awesome to line these up. And you've got to cut all those precisely at the same length so that you don't have any gaps, you know, going across. And anyway, so I had to remake my patterns for this as well as the back leg um, for this project. All right. Can we ask a question? Can I ask a question before we leave this moment? Yeah, sure. Okay, Michelle says so she started cleaning um, their oak bench with Murphy oil soap. Yep. Seems to work great for getting the dirt off. Will the oil soap interfere with a finish like water locks? Hmm. Good question, Michelle. I do not know. What I got, and I always see recommended, I'm going to wash my, my mahogany doors because I've, I've got to put some more finish on there. And I'm going to use the, the sickens. Some of you might have mentioned this. I don't know. But this is a good deck. And so, but I use it on the mahogany 
doors too, so I'm gonna, I've gotta wash those doors down. And a lot of times they recommend TSP, and this is a good heavy duty cleaning before painting or varnishing. I am not sure about Murphy's Oil Soap. Somebody help us out if you've got any ideas on that uh, question, if that will be any issue with the, uh, what kind of finish did you say? Water locks. Water locks on top, yeah. I'm not sure. I would imagine and you're not going to have a problem. Let it dry well and sand it, but worst case scenario is you'd have to just put on a little shellac and then you could go, but I don't think you're going to have a problem. How about cedar for a bench? Is that too soft? Uh, it's soft, but it's, it's not undoable. Um, cypress is a little soft, but not quite as soft as cedar. That is the main setback with that. Uh, redwood, you could use that. That's another softer wood, but that weathers really well as well. So um, we're really in the outdoors today. I'm not, this is different. You have, you have expert uh, helpers here. I'm sure I do. Experienced helpers, I should say. Good. So you can read this later. Okay, I will. All right, we good? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's head, head back to the bench. I just want to show you um, a little bit of what I've had to go through here. Uh, I made, here's my back leg pattern. And this is very similar to chairs we make and all that. So instead of that truncated shorter version for the swing, we added this curvature to the leg. And, and this is kind of the pitch it has. So the seat has a nice kind of curve. You've got the good backrest and you're good to go. So I had to tweak this a touch because um, just because of referencing off surfaces for the new method. I'm going to be, uh, you know, slot cutting in here with a machine. So you're thinking, okay, I've got to make sure that all these parts are, are ready for that process. So I had to tweak a, the angle up here a touch. But um, other than that, this pattern was not bad. But I, since I only had a short piece in my initial bench and the initial course video, in that video, I just show band sawing this out and then cleaning it up by hand. But you may have seen in some of the other ones where we would go to the extent of making a jig that would cut out these efficiently and accurately over and over. And with this process now, I'm going to be getting out three benches. I thought, hey, it'd be fun and nice to incorporate that. It just makes everything more accurate, especially I'm going to be making some nice mortise machining and shouldering tenons. And I want them to come together well and not necessarily clean up the flat surfaces by hand. If they are all uniform and exactly like my template pattern, things just go better. And it's a cool way to do it. I'm going to just show you, this is what I, I made for this project. So I had to make this jig and you can see this is for the outdoor bench. And this is made to skim uh, route the shape and I just use we use this on the craftsman rocking rocking chair you're right David that's right and so this is a little different template and I also used it on the um, the dining chair so this is never going to be shown in a how-to project video but you could make this just using the same principles that we use there. Now we didn't, we did have a link to a video that we made that even if you're not in the neighborhood or whatever, you have access to. So, um, it's in the description. The link is, in yeah. The what's it called? It's called, sh uh, how to sh make a jig for shaping curves. Yeah. So it's the same idea here. And basically in a nutshell, once you have your template, and I make sure I smooth this out and ferret really well, and I mark where the joinery goes and everything, I get a wide enough piece of stock for my base. In this case, I've got a piece of 5 8 inch 
Baltic birch. This stuff's not cheap. It's actually more expensive than um, three quarter because it was a special kind. But I'm, um, I wanted the five eighths because I've got an idea for the core of a, a, a small like dining table that I'm making. Um, and veneering, so I'll be showing you that really soon. But anyway, it made a nice base, and all I do is cut out a wide enough piece. For this one, I had to have a piece. This was just a cutoff that I didn't need from the rest of it. So it's about 12, 13 inches wide by a little over 42 inches long. And it's always a little over the length of the length of the part that you're trying to reproduce. Because you need room on one end for the stops. And then you need room on the other end longer than the piece so that you can start in with the bearing on the flush cutter and then come into the material. So I just use the template as in order to make the jig. So I just tack this right to the plywood after I've sawn like the rough shape then I tack it and set it back a little bit and route it flush route it right to the shape so I end up with the perfect edge that's exactly the same as this front edge and then once I've I have that I route the back side and I do the same thing. I tack it over here, and I, again, I flush route it. Now, this is all more deeply explained if you want to go back and see it where I show doing all these steps, too. And then when I have it tacked to the board, I fit some stops, which are going to reference right off the bottom. So the bottom is going to be cut really cleanly right to a line. And that's going to be my reference when I'm actually shaping these pieces. And then once I've got that all set, then I just have to put in these blocks, which serve two purposes. One, they are stops. They allow you to reference the workpiece against them. And they also act as a nice block to put your little toggle clamps and hold the piece down on the board. So the key, though, is for the piece that's cut first, that's actually this one over here. For the first cut, you want to set wait. I think I got this backwards. Oops. Yeah, I wrote that. I wrote that wrong. Sorry, I wrote the this is actually the first cut over here. I knew that felt funny. Um, <laughs> Just like a snowboard. Yeah, let me change that. But anyway, the reason you go in one direction is you're when you're cutting a curve into grain wood like this, let's just take a piece over here. So we've got a piece of cypress right here. So you can see that. So here we've got the grain is running this way, and you've got this curved piece coming out. Well, when your router bit is spinning, you're going to be going into the grain on either here or here. You can't avoid it. So I choose to go into the grain where the climb or the angle is less. So at the top, it's kind of a long slope angle. And yes, there are light checks on this one that I've got to deal with. Um, at the bottom though, look at this. The, the sweep of that bottom leg is stronger down here, and so going into the grain here would be more of a tear-out situation. So I always set up my jigs so the router bit is spinning and cutting in the friendly direction on the lower section of the leg, okay? Almost always it ends up that way. So this is my first cut. I'd come right across here. So let me make that... Why oh, with that second? First, and this is the second. St <laughs> okay, boy, that's good thing. This isn't for uh, anything big. Uh, but now, here's the key. When I I'm going to trace this piece 
and leave the pen line when I cut it out. So I'm going to end up leaving about a sixteenth of an inch on each side, close to it, right? So what I want to do is set up that first piece. When I set up my stops, I want to set a spacer of a sixteenth of an inch between the template and the stop block. What that's going to do is it's going to, it's going to allow for that sixteenth inch material on the back to be cut off on the second cut. You're not going to, you need to leave some material for the second cut. So we set these blocks a sixteenth of an inch back of the template. And so when those are set, you're still going to have a rough bandsaw on edge here, and you're going to have material overhanging here. So that first cut is going to cut your, your cypress exactly that shape. Then that piece of cypress comes over this side, and it hits against the blocks. And here, for the second cut, the blocks are brought right up to the template when they're fit. And that in that way that that second cut is going to yield the perfect shape because the first cut is already nice and clean and that's leaning right up against the stops and the second cut is going to trace that exact shape that you already routed into this back side and this is all happening referencing off the bottom here let me just do one quick and I'll show you how this goes and you'll maybe you'll get itchy to start making yourself some temp some jigs like this if you've never seen this. So I also want to verify this works well. Um, so I'm gonna get this leg in here. Ryan sure. says, or is asking, rather than having a spacer, could you not move the stops a little further back? Well, that's what it's doing. The, the spacer is just to move the stops back. That's when I'm setting the stops. That's exactly what I'm doing. Was it Brian? Ryan. Ryan. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm just using the spacer to set the stop. So I'm moving it back that sixteenth of an inch. I had it against the template so that's what I did so for that first one yeah and now I've got the material here I'm gonna trace it out trying to make sure I avoid any issues and when I do this I do it in pen and you can see see the distance I'm getting here it's it's giving me a nice clean line that I can see and it also is registering. Let me get the rule out. Let's let's look at this really. Stay right there. So if we measure, you can see I'm a strong 32nd to the outside of the line. So if I just leave that good and full, tiny bit of white, I'm gonna be leaving close to a 16th on both sides. And that works fine for this method. So let's see for this jig here. I'll go across the top and then down the back. And the bottom, this is key. Since this the bottom is my reference on the block, I want to cut that right to the line. That's the one where I'm going to just take the line so I get a really accurate representation. All right, there we are. Let's head over to bandsaw. We'll cut this out. I may have to move this. I'll move that back in a second. All right, I'm going to turn on the dust collector and the saw.
Okay. Okay, so. Hey, can you, before you go forward, can you talk just for a second about the Felder blade, blade size? Oh yeah. Um, I cut all those uh, logs on there and there was some grit, you know, and it, so it dulled it a little faster than I wanted, but I've got a one inch, I think that's a two or three, it's a two per inch teeth pattern. So it's pretty aggressive, but I knew I was gonna be doing some heavier stuff. So it went through that cherry amazingly well. And I was splitting logs that were that high, just pushing them right through. So that's the reason for this. Um, I don't often have as that aggressive, but works great for resawing. Um, here was a little bit funky, it wasn't, and that cypress is quite grainy and um, so you don't get with thicker material it's hard to get as smooth a cut but one of the nice things about having a jig like that is you don't have to sweat it because you're going off the line and you're going to skim it now to perfection so check it out we're going to take it here and we're going to just test it and see how everything looks Here's our first cut, and I want to make sure that I can feel something overhanging all the way down, and I do. I feel just that little bit. Let me show you what it looks like. We have just a little bit overhanging the whole way, and we're right up against our stops nicely. I know that I'm going to have enough material because that accommodate that little shim was adding like a sixteenth to that back. So let's go ahead and lock this in. These toggle clamps. These are like an adjustable pressure style from Bessie that I don't use a lot, but they're kind of cool because, but they're a little finicky to set up. I almost prefer the kind that are more direct and just, you know, have no, these have like a pressure sensitive thing in here. It's a little more fussy. All right, so I'm gonna make my first cut then I'll switch it over and we'll make our second. And let's, we're gonna do this at the router table. Check this out. I've got this nice big uh, shearing cut infinity flush cutting bit in here. This is the, what do they call these? Mega, mega, what was that? It was a- You're asking the wrong person. Oh, I gave you the link. Sorry. Yeah, you gave me the link to the full page of flush cutting route. Oh, okay, yeah. So, it's the so I didn't have a specific one. Yeah, I think they call them the, the infinity megabits or something like that. But they're flush cutters. This is the biggest one. This one's an inch and a half diameter. Um, you may not want to get this one, but they have a three quarter inch diameter that's the same height as this. But mega, one of the mega router bit, Richard says. Mega, okay. Ultimate cam says. Yeah. Uh, now other companies make similar ones. Whiteside has one. And so I'm just showing you this where this happens to be the infinity. Um, but it's got a nice bearing at the bottom and the top. So you could work either way. Here we're going to use the bottom bearing. And I've got its two inch high cutter, which is really critical here because these 
I, I left this leg for this bench is an inch and seven eighths thick. So you got a nice strong leg there on the side. So we're gonna come into this, start it off and just skim cut it right on down. And I may make a second pass because this uh, cypress dust has kind of a grabbiness to it and you'll see it may even build up a little bit between and sometimes it gets here and so I like to brush it off and make a final skim and make sure that there was no shavings like stuck to the template. All right, here we go. We'll turn on the dust collector. And the router. All right. Now normally I would take this to a side table and switch it, uh, not turn it off, but I just want you to see how nice and smooth that is. That's the perfect shape of our template. So there's very little shaping that needs to happen here. This surface is perfectly square and true for the joinery of the rail coming in. And then I have a flat area right here. That's hard to see, but it is flat right here for the arm to come in. So now this smooth surface is going to index against the second blocks. And this is going to go right up, right up to your stop at the bottom against that block and we'll lock it in. Look how nice and tight that's right on there because that's the second machine and this one's nice and tight up here. Let's look at underneath here. See how we've got just that little bit hanging off? So that's, that's no stress at all for a big nice flush cutter like this. And we're gonna turn it on and go ahead and make this second cut. I'll move this back just a little bit. Here we go. All right. Can you talk about the higher uh, back on your router table there? The what? The higher back uh, was. This fence? 
I think that's what was referenced here. Uh, yeah, this is, well, this is the Jessim router table. So this is the fence that it comes with. It's pretty sweet. Really amazing uh, precision adjustments on it and some extra little gadgets to ride with it. It's, it's a great great one. Oh, let me see. Joel, Joel said it this way. I, I think I might have asked it incorrectly. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I noticed that the blade guard is higher than what I thought was normal, about a half to one inch above. Is that higher, high a better choice? The blade guard. There is no blade guard on there. Oh, oh, oh he's talking about he's the talking bandsaw. About the bandsaw. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just had it higher. I, I had moved that fence up earlier and I didn't lower it, but I also, when I'm demonstrating, I, I do like to leave it a little bit higher so you can see what's happening easier um, on the video. But yeah, technically you should have it a little closer to the work than I did. So yeah, good catch. All right, check, check it out. So now I'm gonna take it out. I can feel it's flush to my pattern right there. And now I've got just the perfect shaped leg. I've got an identical copy to my template. That easy. I mean, it, if you're going to make several benches or these are, this kind of jig is especially useful with um, when you're making a set of chairs, dining chairs and whatnot. Um, and it's just a great way to go. So this is going to set me up. I'm going to mark my joinery get all my legs ready and just knock them out uh, with the slot cutter. Uh, but I'll show you that video will be coming out pretty soon. You'll see the whole, the whole thing. But one other thing I'll show you and then we'll be done, except for any other questions you might have. This is the initial template I had for the back. So for the back rest, I also made a little, a little jig to knock those out. And I didn't have it for the leg, but I did have it for the slats. But it had to be readjusted because, as I told you, those slats I cut clean. So I didn't leave enough length here um, for the tenons that I'm going to incorporate on the second ones. We're going to have true tenons and true like mortises so it's going to be different it's it's a little more tricky to do if you are trying to do that you know by other methods but i think using that setup with the multi-co i'm sorry the multi-router it's going to be it's going to be very accurate and so i changed this up i'm going to just have to move my hold downs and i made a new template so this is my this is how it goes on. So you can see I've got a sixteenth of an inch overhanging there again. And I will just be cutting these out of like, I think it's an inch and five eighths material. And what I'll do, let me grab one of those pieces. So this is the stock for this back slats, it's dimensioned, let's see what we got here. We went down to an inch and three quarters. Yeah, that's what I went with, inch and three quarters. So these are gonna be laid right on here like this, and I'll draw the, I'll just nest them and cut them right on across so I get as many as I possibly can. And they'll be cutting, they'll be a little heavy and they'll be skimmed in here. So it's going to make it super easy. Then they'll also be really nice and accurate. There's a little flat area up here that's going to reference off the, the um, mortising table. So that's perfect. And there's a little flat on the bottom that's going to be referencing as well that's going to create the tenon with the shoulders on each one of those. So. That's going to be pretty slick uh, to knock those out and have true tenoned curved back slats across that bench. So it's going to be really have a lot of integrity, be strong, and it's beautiful and comfortable. And it's going to be protected.
because we're, I'm going to use your advice or <laughs> I'm going with the paint again. <laughs> so Tom, um, back to the router table. I believe yes. Rich is asking, would a combination trim bit work best to minimize tear out? Compression technology from white side. Uh, yeah, those compression type cutters. This one actually has uh, a similar cut here. It's got a uh, shearing cut. The, the cutters on this bit are at an angle. They're not quite as advanced as I think what you're saying about that white side compression. But yeah, the, the, the tear out's minimized. I mean, you notice like when I made the second cut, my first cut was on this side, you know, I went this way, that, so the router is spinning this way. The second cut is coming this way, so again, you're, you're in the favorable direction for that steep grain. See how that grain is really running out there. But that's, that's thick enough, and you get plenty of strength there to support the bench. Um, but, yeah, look at, there's really... There's zero tear out. The only place I heard a little something was where there's a, a slight check in the material. And I'm going to just get some glue in there and put a clamp on it. And that'll be it. Okay, I do have a few questions. Okay. Are you going to show the multi router? Uh, I'll just, it's not fully set up. Here it is right here. Give you an advanced preview. But I've got to get some of the. Um, Accessories on in the they're the arm control arms and the router gets in here the hold downs, but It's uh, it, it's impressive an impressive machine. It's not Inexpensive but for what you get man. It's a deal and if you're gonna do like limited production work That's why I was looking at it all that long ago. I ended up never really doing limited production work uh, I ended up doing custom high-end furniture for that whole time which gave me a lot of variety of experience but um, I often thought man if I could produce stuff but it's pretty boring to just make the same thing and then you would have to have you basically would be wholesaling what you're making so there's trade-offs you know if you want to work that way but if you wanted to you know if you had a run of something you were making unbelievable because it's it's great at more tenants um, but it also can do finger joints really well, and um, it, does, it has a setup for dovetails as well. So where I really want to use it is for mortise and tenons and see how accurate and repetitive, repetitively accurate you can be for those small production runs of things. Okay. Do you sharpen your own router bits? No, I do not. Uh, there are places you can send them out. Um, trying to think. Guy I used to use locally here went out of business, but um, I'm trying to think if, does anyone know if uh, Ridge Carbide sharpens bits like that? I think they're primarily saw blades. I'm trying to remember where I saw that. If anyone knows where Chime in if you've got a good source for sharpening router bits, because usually it's not expensive and you can get them touched up a few times or whatnot. What else you got? Are you going to spray the paint um, when you make the paint the bench? You know, if you if you're painting three benches, it wouldn't be a bad idea. And I did pick up a sprayer, um, a used one, so that I've been wanting to try out it's just you got to get all the lines full and all that you know so you got to have enough to do to justify spraying but that's a good candidate for spraying because you've got a lot of little nooks and crannies um, but with a roller and a brush you can you can get it on there pretty fast because if I spray it I'm still going to want to brush it out you know I don't like on something like that I want to leave nice clean brush strokes not just spray off a gun it's just harder I'm very used to spraying um, materials like shellac and lacquers. And lacquer is a heavy body, but paint is another thing altogether. It's heavy. It's a heavy material. And so it goes on nicely, but I think 
I'm just old school like that. I want to brush it out after. Is anyone else like that? <laughs> you just got to brush it out. Okay. Um, I was looking for a question somebody had asked about the Coopered table um, that you introduced the other day, but I can't find it. Find it. Oh. Um, oh, the little... Have you made uh, any progress on the base, I think, is what the question no, was. No, I, I have made progress in thinking about how to build it. Um, and I've got, thanks to a number of people, actually, um, I think it was in the neighborhood, the neighbor, yeah, the neighborhood, <laughs> we, uh, we've had some exchanges of, of articles and, um, what else, formulas to calculate the, that issue. This was the little model that we made that night. We're talking about this type of base for this slab. So that's kind of a, that represents the slab size and that base. But instead of doing tapered staves, I I'm think I'm going to have an, ex, an expansion contraction issue around the base. Um, it, would, it would definitely be moving <laughs> and contracting. So I think I might instead, um, I went back and forth with someone else too. The other way to do it is to brick lay it so you cut angles and you actually do a circular brick lay and step it in so you could chuck it and then turn it. But that's going to be tricky because of the orientation of the grain um, when you're turning it. So I don't know. I'm still not Tom, totally. what was the name of the company that bought Rich Carbide? What's that? The name of the company that bought oh, Rich Carbide. Oh, Everlast Saw. Everlast Saw. Yeah, and they did move it to Kansas. You're right. They, they contributed to our to Epic Weekend um, event, sent us some blades for the members. That's I mean, the right. Attendees. The lucky winners. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. So, okay. I think we're good. All right. Um, oh, Applebee. Good substitute for Baltic plywood, Dennis is asking. Is that a question? I mean, that's a question. No, no what, did he, what did he call it? Apple ply? Apple ply. Apple pies. Applebee, yeah. Oh, Man, you must be gosh. hungry. I'm sorry. Is what, apple what ply a good substitute for Baltic plywood? Let me. Apple ply. Um, Sorry, it's the I have not used apple ply. I've seen it. I'm trying to remember. As I recall, it's a really good quality plywood, but I can't. You know what? I I'm drawing a blank on the the characteristics of it. But my memory just is that it's it's a good quality, but someone else is going to have to. You could just look it up online, I think, and see how it compares. But I think it is comparable to Baltic off the top of my head without looking back. But All right, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. That was kind of a grab bag of topics <laughs> tonight with the outdoor furniture and uh, the slab top. And we did get into this nice template and talked about this handy-dandy uh, jig for cutting curved parts, which can be adapted in so many ways, as you see from the leg and the slat back. And sky's the limit. So thanks so much. Hey, again, if you want to go deeper with us, head on over to epicwoodworking.com. Check out the neighborhood. That's where there's some amazing uh, opportunity for you to membership community that we have yeah yeah it's it's got a lot of good benefits and you also get access to all the courses all the courses and this in this uh, private forum where Tom gets in and chats with the guys and girls that's so, right it's awesome that's right so uh, but thanks for being part of this if you enjoy this content go ahead and like share and subscribe and um, we'll look forward to seeing you next time yeah on behalf of the camera lady and I, we'll see you next Thursday, right back here on Shop Night Live! Awesome. Good night, everybody. Watch out. Have a fun week, guys. Thank you. <laughs>